Jesus called the Apostle Paul a chosen vessel. He was among the most dynamic ministers who ever lived. But when he wrote his second letter to Timothy, he was in prison bonds, which severely limited what he could personally do to spread the good news. But that situation did not dishearten him. His letter refers to what others were doing. Luke was there with him in Rome, but still free. Aquila and Priscilla were still working hard in Ephesus. He asked for Mark to come to assist him with the ministry, and of course he gave instructions to his beloved son, Timothy. But most important, notice what he said at 2 Timothy 2 and verses 8 and 9. Second Timothy chapter two and verses eight and nine. Remember that Jesus Christ was raised up from the dead and was David's offspring, according to the good news I preach, for which I am suffering and being imprisoned as a criminal. Nevertheless, the word of God is not bound. Yes, Paul was in chains, limiting what he could do, but the word of God, the message that he and others had been proclaiming was not bound. It was alive. It was in the hearts of thousands of people that they had preached to. And it was to be recorded in countless copies of the scriptures in time. Once this message was unleashed, the power of it could never be bound again. I'll just read Hebrews 4.12, the first part, it connects with this scripture. It says, For the word of God is alive and exerts power. Now, on the second expression, exerts power, the Greek word, according to the kingdom interlinear, says that it is living and energetic. In fact, we derive the English word energy from this word. But the context shows both in Hebrews and in 2 Timothy, that the word of God refers to the message or expression of God's purpose. And of course, that message is closely connected to the Bible today because that's the book that contains that message for us. And through the centuries, opponents have tried to lessen the power or energy of the Bible in these three ways. First, by removing God's name from copies of the Bible. Second, by destroying copies of the scriptures in past centuries, and more recently, by making it difficult to obtain in many languages. And third, by means of inaccurate and inaccurate translation and dead language. These three developments have been like a short circuit in an electric line the power is hindered from reaching its destination. Jehovah's organization has moved in the opposite direction on these three fronts. And tonight we're going to consider three roles of the New World Translation in ensuring that the power of Jehovah's word is not bound. First, by making God's name known earthwide. Second, by making the scriptures freely available to all. And third, by making God's message accurate, clear, and alive. And we're also going to discuss the role of the worldwide Bethel family in this regard. So first, we're going to consider the role of the New World Translation in making God's name known earthwide. Before Christ's brothers began work on the New World Translation in the 1940s, English Bibles, like American Standard Version, Rotherham's, and others, had already restored the divine name in the Hebrew Scriptures based on the, the strong manuscript evidence that they found. Translations like the emphatic diaglot even used it in the Greek Scriptures. But these translations were like the proverbial dead lion of Ecclesiastes 9.4. In the 1940s, people almost exclusively read the archaic King James Version, with its four occurrences of Jehovah's name. The first real challenge to the dominance of the King James Version in English was the Revised Standard Version, which was published in 1952. 
but the committee of that version strongly rejected the American Standard Bible policy of using the divine name, and they substituted it everywhere with Lord. And today, almost all English Bibles follow that policy. There are a few exceptions, but this is the mainstream. In fact, here are the five best-selling English Bibles, according to the Christian Booksellers Association. The total occurrences of the name Jehovah in these four Bibles are the four occurrences in King James Version, plus the seven occurrences of Yahweh in the New Living Translation. There are no occurrences in any of the other three Bibles, New International Version, New King James Version, and English Standard Version. That means that all of these popular Bibles say, I am the Lord, that is my name, or the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Consider Exodus 6.3 in the popular, actually the best-selling New International Version. It's even past the King James Version. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. There are four names here in the Hebrew text, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the Tetragrammaton, Jehovah. Now, a primary reason given in the Revised Standard Version and many other Bibles for substituting Lord is because Jehovah is not the original pronunciation or that it should be Yahweh. But the fact is we don't pronounce Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the same way that the ancient Jews did. We don't probably know exactly how they pronounced it. It may vary, have varied over the centuries. But following their reasoning, their translation should say, I appeared to your forefather, and to his son, and to his grandson, as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. Now, this is obviously an unreasonable approach to translating the first three names. Don't you agree? But that's exactly what they did with the fourth name. They said, we don't pronounce it the same way, so we're not going to translate it. But taking this even a step further, If they were so concerned that Jehovah is not the exact pronunciation of God's name, what about the name Jesus? Acts 4.12 says, there's no other name that has been given by which we must get saved. So is its pronunciation equally important? In fact, scholars don't even agree on whether Jesus and his disciples spoke Hebrew or Aramaic, which would affect the pronunciation. Hebrew would be something like Yeshua, Aramaic Yeshu, something like that. But what about the poor Greek-speaking disciples who didn't have the SH sound? They said Jesus, but that was the form recorded in the inspired scriptures. The most corrupted pronunciation is Jesus in English. It's nothing like they would have said it in the first century, but that doesn't prevent its use some 900 times or even more in all of these Bibles. So their position on removing God's name on the grounds of pronunciation is indefensible. In legal terms, the legal department would call it a crime of omission. But the situation regarding God's name is the same and even worse in other languages. Well, you ask, how could it be worse? when God's name is substituted with the name of a local God. That was done with the Chichewa Bible in Malawi. This journal, it's called the Bible Translator. It sets policies for translators of the United Bible Societies worldwide. And it explains why Jehovah's name was replaced with the name Chauta. Here they give the reason. In this respect, The important revelation for Chewa people today is that the foreign deity, Yehovah, is really Chauta, the God they've always known and worshipped, and the God whom their ancestors also turned to for help in the time of trouble. It's incredible reasoning, isn't it? No wonder our Chewa Bibles refuse to use this Bible 
though it was far easier to understand than their previous Bible. This is one of the so-called solutions found in this special issue of the Bible Translator from October 1992 on the topic translating the names of God. And these policies are still current among translators today. The editor's opening comments give an idea of the direction given. It has become clear in recent years that no one solution to the problems we face in translating the names of God will meet all situations. First, their wording gives the impression that God has a number of personal names. Also, these consultants frequently call it a problem because for them it is a genuine problem. They know that God's name is the most frequently occurring name in the whole Bible. It occurs thousands of times in the Hebrew text. And they also know why others include it in the Bible. In fact, on page 409 of, the, of this journal, there is a quote from the foreword of the American Bible Society, of the American Standard Bible Society. This personal name, Jehovah, with its wealth of sacred associations, is now restored to the place in the sacred text to which it has an unquestionable claim. And that's what the American Standard Bible did. And it sounds reasonable. But notice the conclusion. It cannot be denied that this American Standard view influenced the thinking of scores of evangelical missionaries who were sent out to various places in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Consequently, the name Jehovah was mistakenly introduced as a translation of the name of God, a name which would remain undisputed and be considered unchangeable for many years to come. So they view Jehovah as a mistake. They don't say Jesus was a mistake, even though, as we saw, the same pronunciation issues apply. But this so-called mistake led to an interesting situation. As they say, scores of Bibles were produced by those missionary translators, and they used the name thousands of times. But many of those missionaries who translated those Bibles were not native speakers, so their translations were often difficult to understand. In the latter half of the 20th century, translators like Eugene Nida led a movement to revise many of those older Bibles to make them more understandable. But Nida, whom the New York Times refers to as the father of modern Bible translation, expresses his view about the divine name in his book, The Theory and Practice of Translation. He says, there is a kind of divine ambiguity in the use of the same term to apply both to God and to Jesus Christ. Ambiguity, yes, but not divine. Such statements are repeated in other references, for example, by consultants for the Wycliffe Bible Society, and they show the real reason why so-called Christian translators are so ready to omit the name Jehovah, because it creates confusion between Jehovah and his son, Jesus Christ. Because of these developments, brothers in fields like Chichewa, Hindi, Thai, and others were left with a choice. Either use a hard-to-understand Bible containing God's name or a readable one that omitted the name. What do you think the brothers did? In almost every case, they chose the difficult Bible, even if, even if it was harder for them to read and understand because it had Jehovah's name in it. To understand the frustration, imagine this sister in India trying to explain why we are called Jehovah's Witnesses to this householder. She could read Isaiah 43.10, but if her Bible said, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, she might have to explain, in Hebrew, there are four letters here that should say Jehovah. The woman might ask, what is Hebrew? What does Hebrew have to do with this? After explaining, she might ask our sister, so do you know Hebrew, that you can explain this to me? Some brothers have been so frustrated that they would read Jehovah even when their Bible said Lord, but when 
the householder would see that they're reading something different, they would become suspicious. But it's interesting talking about the context of India. This Bible translator has an article about the reaction in Christendom, not among our brothers, but in Christendom, when Jehovah's name was replaced by the word Prabhu or Lord in Hindi and Nepali Bibles. The article entitled, What is His Name? Translation of Divine Names in Indian Languages explains. Not all Christians are happy with this solution, however. He's talking about Christians in Christendom. The first reason is an emotional one. The readers have been so used to reading and hearing the transliteration, Jehovah, that they have come to attach some kind of sacred significance to it. Poor people. They have become so emotionally attached to the name that no amount of argument can make them change their minds. The second reason, as some Nepali Christians told me, they are often asked by Hindus for the name of the Christian God. The Hindus claim that all Hindu gods and goddesses have a personal name, such as Ram, Krishna, Brahma. And when they know the names of the gods and goddesses, they can relate themselves to the deities. Now, since Prabhu or Lord can be used for husband, master, and God, Hindus will not accept it as being God's name. So he continues in his article, the Hindus are not interested in the title of God. They want to know the personal name of God. And unless they know the name, they cannot relate themselves to the one who bears it. Now notice his conclusion. Having said all this, however, and having argued in favor of translating the name YHWH by Lord, I must concede that in the light of recent studies, a new approach may become necessary. That means that the last word has not been said on the question of rendering the Tetragrammaton in North Indian and other languages. Well, happily, this is the last statement we're going to read from the Bible translator, and it's the only one we agree with. In fact, the last word for some languages of India was spoken one month ago. On September 4th, 2016, a video of Brother Hurd was broadcast throughout India, in Sri Lanka, and to brothers in other locations, as he announced the release of the complete New World Translation in Hindi, Malayalam, and Tamil, and the Christian Greek scriptures in Marathi and Telugu. The whole New World Bible was already available in Sinhala and the Greek scriptures in Kannada, Gujarati, Nepali, and Punjabi. So our brothers in India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka have all these Bibles available to make Jehovah's name known in that vast field of 1.3 billion people. Jehovah says at Ezekiel 38:23, I will certainly magnify myself and sanctify myself and make myself known before the eyes of many nations, and they will have to know that I am Jehovah. Not that I am the Lord, not that I am Prabhu or Senor or Chauta, but Jehovah. The undeniable trend in Bible translation worldwide is to omit God's name. And Jehovah is countering that by using the New World Translation to figuratively unchain his people from Bibles that fail to honor and sanctify his name. And we're happy that 95% of our brothers in India and over 90% worldwide have a modern translation of at least the, Christ the Christian Greek scriptures that uses the name Jehovah. Second, we're going to discuss the role of the New World Translation in making the scriptures freely available. In the past, opponents like Roman Emperor Diocletian and the clergy of the Middle Ages gathered and burned copies of the scriptures. The Bible survived and copies are freely available in languages like English, French, and Spanish, and others. But today, economic and copyright issues have made the Bible difficult to obtain in many languages. A South American missionary wrote, 
the Bible societies translate into many Amerindian languages, but it seems like every new translation is just a trophy. It is translated, printed in a few copies, and then forgotten. Usually these translations are expensive, complicated, and simply not available to the people who need them. A request was made to translate the New World Translation into a language of the Pacific because the only Bible had removed the divine name completely and it is not readily available. Since only small quantities of this Bible were originally printed and it is not currently being reprinted. Yes, it's true that the Bible has been translated whole or in part into 2,800 and more languages, but it is readily available in just a fraction of those languages. And Bibles are especially poor in areas where the population uh, doesn't have money to spend on Bibles, printing is unprofitable, and it's often in areas where we have great increases. In some languages, a Bible may cost up to a monthly salary, and the copies that brothers get for their monthly salary are often missing pages, sometimes whole Bible books, and sometimes they're just roughly bound photocopies. When a, when a branch office tries to obtain Bibles at reduced cost or even offers to reprint the Bible in such languages, they are often rebuffed by the copyright holders. In Malawi, for example, our brothers were told not even to quote the Bible in our publications so that the sales of their Bible would not be threatened. Visitors to some African lands have, have been shocked to see over 100 brothers sharing two or three Bibles in a congregation. A brother wrote, most Chaluba-speaking brothers in Congo did not own a Bible. Each copy was passed around like a microphone when a read scripture was called. Otetela congregations in Congo often just had one or two copies. Brothers used to go to the Kingdom Hall to practice their talk on the Bible. Well, this makes these images of Brother Lush in Congo releasing the Christian Greek scriptures in Chaluba, Congo, and Otetela even more meaningful. This brother's reaction may seem dramatic to us, but it may have been his first personal copy of the Bible. And you see this crowd carefully studying their new Bibles. I notice they're not comparing it with their previous copy, likely because for many of them there was no previous copy. Think also if brothers had such a hard time getting a Bible, how easy would it be for a Bible student to get a copy? The Rwanda branch wrote that 18 Bible students there in an isolated group hesitated to stop preaching, start preaching because no one in their group had a Bible. When they received the Kinyarwanda Christian Greek scriptures, they felt confident to begin their public ministry. In other language fields where Bibles were scarce, scarce, they would not sell them to Jehovah's Witnesses even if they had the money. When Kyrgyz brothers tried to buy Bibles at a religious bookstore, they would be asked, what is God's name? If they gave the answer, no Bible. Similar situations used to exist for Albanian, Isoko, Malagasy, Tsotsil, and many other fields. Now the tables have turned in many of these places. The easiest way to get a Bible is to go visit a kingdom hall. An elderly man from the mountains of East Timor traveled down to the capital in search of a Tetun Bible. The closest thing he could find was an Indonesian Bible at the store for 45 US dollars, two weeks salary for him, not even in his language. The storekeeper said, you should go and find Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, after searching all day that day and most of the next day, he finally found the brothers. And he was delighted to receive Bibles, Bible literature, and also have a discussion with them. He said it was the answer to his prayers. The brothers said he now sends text messages from the mountains with questions about what he's reading in his Tatoon Bible. A Hiligaynon-speaking brother from Philippines wrote, 
People now ask, what will happen to your organization since you are freely distributing this Bible? They're worried about us running out of money. The usual answer, it is Jehovah's will to let all people know his name. Do you think he will let the funds run out? And the brothers say always good conversations are generated from that. It's true that the generous contributions of Jehovah's people in more prosperous lands make this possible. But it also makes us think of Isaiah 55.1. And let's turn there to Isaiah 55.1. says there, come all you thirsty ones, come to the water. You with no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Now, if you read further in this chapter, it's clear that this is a messianic prophecy. And we have no doubt that Jesus Christ is the one orchestrating this campaign of distribution of millions of Bibles along with Bible literature to the poor and the humble people of the earth. He won't allow the power of God's word to be bound by economic or copyright issues. Next, we're going to discuss the role of the New World Translation in making the Bible's message clear and alive. The existence of thousands of languages and their subtle differences is a natural obstacle to communication. To illustrate, a Brazilian Bethelite was asked where a visitor was. He responded, he passed away. When he saw the shocked reaction of the brother, he said, no, 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 he passed out. The other brother was still concerned, and he finally pointed and he said, he went that way. <laughs> Obviously, this brother struggled with the nuances of English. Now, now think about Bible translation. It involves understanding the nuances of what was written thousands of years ago in ancient Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and translating those thoughts into English and hundreds of other languages. It is an enormous challenge. But remember that many Bibles previously used by our brothers were translated by individuals who knew that God's name was in the Bible and they refused to put it in the text. Now imagine these same individuals believe that God and Jesus are the same person or that the dead live on in heaven and hell. How do you think it affects their translation of difficult doctrinal passages? As an example, the traditional Thai Bible says that Ecclesiastes 9.10 there is no work, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in ghost city where you are going. At Acts 2.27, the Chinese Union version says about Jesus, you will not leave my spirit, or it can be understood as ghost, in the yin world, that is the nether world. Now this actually reflects what many Chinese people think happens to the dead. And it's why they offer food and objects that they think people will need in the yin world. But it's interesting that even a word-by-word -word translation of the pre-2013 English New World translation was confusing in Chinese. The previous word for soul sounded like spirit ghost, and Hades sounded like a geographical location, like Haiti might sound to us. So saying, you will not leave my Juan or soul ghost in Hades sounded like Jesus' ghost was stuck in a place called Hades. The Chinese translators were the first to re receive approval to say, you will not leave me in the grave. Straightforward. This set a pattern. Almost all languages following the Chinese used this solution. Then in 2013, the English New World Translation did the same. But translating such verses as ancient Bible writers understood them has lifted a huge burden from the shoulders of our brothers. They, they, used to try, excuse me, they used to try to explain the correct meaning using a Bible that distorted the meaning. But the need for clarity goes beyond doctrinal issues. Let's consider the challenge of translating verses like Matthew 5 and verse 3.
It says there, happy are those conscious of their spiritual need for the kingdom of the heavens belongs to them. The original Greek literally says, happy the poor as to the spirit, which makes no sense in English or even in modern Greek. The English rendering beautifully expresses the idea of being aware of one's spiritual poverty. But since a word-for-word -word translation of the English or Greek is often impossible in other languages, Bible translation teams have submitted 37 questions on this verse alone. For example, is happy better expressed by elated, jubilant, or blessed? Can conscious of be better expressed by recognize, thirst for, or hunger for? Saying belongs to them. The kingdom belongs to them sounds like they own the kingdom. Is that the idea? Or is it better to say meant for them? Then the expression spiritual need is a problem in many languages. Translated literally, it could sound like the philosophical need in some languages. In other languages, like their need for wicked spirits or ghosts. One African trainer observed, in many African languages, there is only one vernacular equivalent for spiritual, wind, air, oxygen, gas, and spiritism. So a literal translation is confusing and often gives a completely wrong meaning. It could sound like happy are those who know they need oxygen. So translation teams might test out many different variations before finalizing such a verse. Another example is Ecclesiastes 8, 9. All of this I have seen, and I applied my heart to every work that has been done under the sun during the time that man has dominated man to his harm. Now, we often focus on the part after the comma. But in languages where the heart is simply an organ of the body that doesn't think, saying applied my heart makes no sense at all. Saying under the sun gives a strange picture of things happening direct, directly below where the sun is located at a certain time. So before even reaching the main point of the verse, there are a number of linguistic stumbling blocks that the translators have to address. In some languages, like Hindi, this verse might read, all of this I have seen and I have paid attention to all the things happening in the world, not under the sun, and seen that during this time, man has only brought problems to man by ruling over him. Now you can imagine each project involves a lot of research, long discussions, and fervent prayer to ensure accurate and clear translation. Now, another issue that arises has to do with the langu language registry. Some think that Bible language should sound somehow loftier or holier than everyday language. For centuries, the Catholic Church kept the Bible in the dead Latin language. Greek Orthodox clergymen today still chant the Bible in ancient Greek, a beautiful language that hardly anyone understands. And many are still enamored by the archaic King James Version. And this kind of thinking has affected Bibles in other languages. For example, a lot of the Bibles in India use san terms that are derived from Sanskrit, terms that people hardly know. The previous Maltese, Myanmar, Thuy, and Vietnamese Bibles all used, among many others, all used very difficult to understand vocabulary. So just using simple, everyday language greatly enhances Bible reading. For example, previous Thai Bibles use the literary royal style. Now in Thai, pronouns can take many forms depending on who is speaking and who is being spoken to. For example, kings like David would require one pronoun, nobles another, the common people a different one, God a different one. There are 17 different ways to say I in Thai, if you could imagine. And some of those ways are never used in everyday speech. And that's why one sister wrote and said, I like how the Thai New World Translation 
uses pronouns that we use in daily life. In Psalm 5, when David expressed his feelings to Jehovah using the pronoun I that we use, I can now see David as a real person and can feel how depressed David felt at that time. I read that chapter with a tear in my eye and felt like I was David, expressing my feelings and problems to Jehovah. All that from using normal pronouns. The Armenia branch wrote, prior to its release, readers put lots of effort into understanding what they read from their archaic Armenian Bibles. Now they put that same effort into studying it. A Turkish brother said about the New World Translation in Turkish, the Apostle Paul especially finally speaks understandable Turkish. <laughs> now the following video is going to show how the ASL Bible has enhanced Bible study for thousands of our deaf brothers and sisters. I would always think, I want to be able to read the Bible from start to finish too. I should read the Bible every day, and so I decided to do just that. However, whenever I started, I would read a bit and eventually stop. I would try again, only to stop. I could never get far. It was very difficult to feel moved or to see Jehovah as a real person when reading the Bible in English. Then, something very special happened. It was at a district convention in 2005. I'll never forget this. They announced that the Christian Greek scriptures would be translated into American Sign Language. Everyone, including myself, was thrilled. A few months later, the Bible book of Matthew was released on DVD. I remember the first time putting the DVD into the player and watching the signer on the screen. I was astounded. I could see the facial expressions, the emotions, the signs all coming to life and helping me to understand what was being said in the Bible. I watched it all the way through, again and again and again. And I would do this every time until another Bible book was released in ASL. The Bible presented in my language helps me to see Jehovah. I can see his love for me. I see him counseling me like a father. He encourages me, cherishes me. I can see all this, not when I'm reading the Bible in English, but in sign language. I always thank Jehovah for this gift. Her comments help us to see how Jehovah is fulfilling his word at Deuteronomy chapter 30 in verses 13 and 14. Deuteronomy 30, 13 and 14. Nor is it on the other side of the sea, so that you have to say, who will cross over to the other side of the sea and get it for us? so that we may hear it and observe it. For the word is very near you, in your own mouth and in your own heart, so that you may do it. Previously, for many brothers to understand the Bible, it was like crossing the sea. It was such an effort in study and understanding what the Bible said. But now, with the New World Translation in such an understandable style, it's penetrating people's hearts. And, the, and enhancing the effect of God's word on their mouth by making their preaching of the good news more effective. Jehovah today is ensuring that his inspired message is not bound by language differences. Now we're going to briefly consider the role of the worldwide Bethel family in this effort to produce the New World Translation. In 1989, the governing body established a world headquarters department to support uh, the New World Translation uh, development. And at that time, it was available in 11 languages, whole or in part. 
This chart shows that the number of languages will reach 148 by December of this year, including eight sign languages. And you see that the increase is dramatic, especially since 2005, because that was the year that the governing body made Bible translation a higher priority. Just in 2016, by the end of the year, we will have had 21 releases. Over 500 Bethelites serve on some 100 Bible translation or revision teams. As we saw, translators carefully study each verse to make sure that they get the right understanding and render it correctly. And there is a, a full-time staff at headquarters to field their questions. Over the years, more than 100,000 questions have been asked. In 2015 alone, 8,500 questions were answered. But besides Bible translators, outside re readers review the text. Others do proofreading, composition, digital publishing. The brothers in Thailand even created a beautiful new font for their Thai New World Translation to make it easier to read. Over the years, MEPS programming has developed a specialized computer system for Bible translation. The US and Japan printeries have worked two and three shifts to make sure that release dates are met, including that of the English revision. Bindery workers, for example, with this Thai Bible, they have to hand feed each copy of the Bible because of the extra pages needed to make the font big enough to be legible. This Bible is over 2,300 pages. It's much bigger than our English New World Translation. But the brothers in Japan willingly and happily do that for their Asian brothers. Each Bible requires the united effort of hundreds. Each one has a story involving training, long hours, problem solving, and great sacrifices. Uh, for example, an experienced translator and father of 10 was in his 60s when he was asked to work on the translation in his language. He commuted two hours a day for years to work on that project. Two elderly couples moved from their comfortable homes in Central Europe to work and live on a, basically a construction site for years in barracks until their project was finished. A brother in the final stages of Parkinson's disease checked every verse for accuracy. These are just a few of the hundreds of examples we could mention. Like the Apostle Paul languishing in prison, many of us are now limited in what we can personally accomplish in Jehovah's service. But our worldwide Bethel family can feel great satisfaction to see God's word and publications based on it being made freely available throughout the earth. Jehovah is the one who confused the languages, but he foretold that his message would not be bound by languages. He is causing it to penetrate language barriers. A Hindi brother wrote about the recent release, my wife and I just read the book of Proverbs. It is very, very encouraging to hear Jehovah's voice in a tongue that touches our hearts. I previously felt as if the Bible was covered over by a, dark, by a net. Though we were able to read it, we could not see everything clearly. Now I feel as if everything is happening right before my eyes. A Tamil reader said, thank you for completely changing our opinion that the Bible can never be understood, and in fact, for making it so easily understandable. A Rwandan witness said, I now understand the feelings of Jehovah and of persons mentioned in the Bible. Jehovah now speaks Kinyarwanda, and it seems that the Hebrews were Rwandans. <laughs> Such comments make all the hard work of the translators worthwhile. Now let's read Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. Philippians 2.13 says, 
For God is the one who, for the sake of his good pleasure, energizes you, giving you both the desire and the power to act. This reminds us of Paul's words in Hebrews 4.12, where it said that the word of God is alive and energetic or exerts power. But the difference here in Philippians is that God himself is the subject of the sentence. He is the one who exerts power. He is the one that provides the energy and the motivation to his people. And there is no doubt that Jehovah is the one who energized and moved his anointed servants to embark on this campaign of Bible translation and distribution. He has also energized members of the great crowd to support that work. And what has been the result? First, millions of Jehovah's people daily use a Bible that honors his name. Second, God's people have been given the energy and motivation to distribute Bibles and Bible literature so that even the poor are hearing the good news in harmony with Matthew 11.5. And third, Jehovah is breaking the language barrier so that his people are enjoying unprecedented clarity in their Bible study. And we're especially grateful to have all the new Bibles and revisions based on the simple, clear 2013 revision. It is exciting to see how Jehovah is already using the New World Translation to communicate his will to millions of his sheep in over 140 languages. The result of this great effort has been enhanced spirituality, unity of thought as an organization, and a powerful tool to carry on the greatest preaching campaign in history. We can't help but echo the words of Psalm 118.23, this has come from Jehovah and it is wonderful in our eyes. We now look forward to see how Jehovah will use this translation to sanctify his great name before all of Earth's population. Yes, we're grateful to Jehovah for the New World Translation, a translation that strengthens our conviction that the power of his word can never be bound. 